hello, anyone who's watching and listening. Um, my name is Colin Farrell, and I am here today to talk to my new friend, Sinead Burke, about her book, Break the Mold, How to Take Your Place in the World. And Sinead and I just met via email initially about a week ago, and then we had a conversation on the phone. And now it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Sinead to all of you out there. And we're going to talk about her, and we're going to talk about her book and her inspiration and her life. So without further ado, Sinead Burke. Hello. Gosh, this feels uh, very surreal for you to be the one introducing me, Colin. I have long admired your work, so it is such an honour that we all get to share this conversation about the things that drive us, the ways in which disability, identity, difference has impacted all of our lives. And yeah, I hope this is a really fruitful conversation for the parents, the adults and the children who will watch this today. So thank you so much for saying yes and for allowing me to irritate you via email, phone and every form of media that exists. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. No irritation at all. And the thing is, I uh, it is completely my pleasure and my honour to be doing an interview and the interview to not be about me because that is a shortcut <laughs> to boredom. Talking about myself is a shortcut to boredom for me outside of the therapeutic environment, that is, of course. Um, Sinead, tell us a little bit about yourself, would you please? It's such an honour to talk to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your life in that. Sure. So my name is Sinead. From the earliest of ages, I have wanted to be a teacher. I can remember coming home from my first day of school and telling my mum and dad that I was going to be a teacher. Now, my dad, he's a little person like me, which means that I'm about three and a half foot tall, 105 centimetres. And... When I told my parents that that's what I wanted to do, they just said, great, brilliant, you should do it. They never said, oh, how are you going to be able to reach the blackboard? Or what about the children? They're going to be bigger than you. How are you going to hang up the artwork on the wall? None of the teachers who are in your school look like you. Are you going to be able to do it? My parents never passed on any of those fears or concerns to me. I don't know if they even actually had them, but I'm so lucky that I grew up in a family that loved me loved me for who I was, didn't erase my disability or the fact that I was a little person, but told me all through life that I might have to find a different way in which to go about things and to do things. But it didn't mean that anything was impossible. I just looked at the world from a different perspective. And that was to be celebrated and cherished rather than looked at as a challenge or something that was different about me in a negative way. And really that drive to be a teacher stayed with me forever. I loved school. School was this incredible safe place for me to figure out who I was. And I got to go to school with these amazing girls. And I went over to the classroom library. I picked up books. I went to the playhouse and spent all of my time dressing up as, gosh, I don't know, it's being embarrassing. And school was just <laughs> amazing. My teachers gave me space to figure out who I was. And it was just the most special place. And I wanted to recreate that for other children. I wanted to create a space for children to figure out who they were. Yes, curriculum and learning and homework was important, but being able to facilitate their goals and ambitions is what drove me. And I really miss being in the classroom. It was my favorite place to be. How, thank you, it's so beautiful to hear. How, how old were you when you realized that you wanted to be a teacher? What age did that hit? It was really early. I was also the child. So I'm the yeah. eldest of five. I have three sisters right. and one brother. And I had said when I was four that I wanted to be a teacher, but it became really obvious when Ooh, I was about, four. I'm going to say nine or 10, which wow. is already too old to be doing this. But I had played this game with my siblings during the summer that really wasn't actually a game. It was torture where I used to call a club where I used to make them little notebooks and I used to make them little workbooks of all of the things that I had learned in school and I would be the teacher. And I would teach <laughs> them. But I used to get really frustrated that at nine and ten, my six, four and three year old siblings didn't know what I was doing at school. And I used to think it was because I was a bad teacher. I didn't understand that they just weren't old enough to be able to understand multiplication and division. So I think that notion of being a teacher was something that's been part of me always. But yeah, when I went to secondary school, I had one choice on my CEO form. So the CEO form is what you fill in at the end of secondary mm. school. And it lists all of your choices if you want to go to university or college and the courses that you might like to do. And it's a form that's in Ireland. And in Ireland, maybe people fill in 20 choices or 30 choices. I filled in one. I remember. I knew exactly the college and the university really? I wanted to go to. And that was it. And yeah, it was the one dream that I had and I wanted it to be fulfilled. 
Ah, that's amazing to have such clarity at such a young age. And come here from such a young age, it sounds like you were taking responsibility as well, not only for yourself, but for those around you. And you felt a responsibility to to impart a sense of proactivity or doing. I mean, you were talking about your siblings who were six, four and three when you were nine and ten. And if they didn't know what you were doing we were in school, you thought it was your fault. You thought that you were a bad teacher. <laughs> I mean, you... <laughs> it could just be my vanity. I mean... <laughs> it could be my vanity. <laughs> and and so you're so you're a little person and yeah. you're the only little person in your family outside of your dad your dad is a little person and your mom is what would we call your mom what would we call someone who's not a little person typical um so we would say average height average height yeah so you so your dad is a little person and your mom's average height mm -hmm. yeah and, and then your, all of my siblings your... are average height what was it like for your dad? Because I want to hear more, of course, about your life. But what was it like for your dad to grow up as a little person in Ireland in the in the you know seventies, sixties, seventies? What was that like for him? Did he share much of his experience of being unique, as unique as he is, as we all are? Which we'll get to, of course. Every single person, seven plus billion people on this planet, yeah. are all unique. And this is the beautiful message in your book: is that each of us has has an opportunity to find what makes us special and to celebrate that, no matter what society tells us we should be or what kind of categories we should be fit into. The, the idea of celebrating uniqueness is the, such a stark message in your book. But did your dad share some of his struggles growing up as well? Yeah, my dad is quite different to me in terms of growing up in that he was the only little person in his household. He was the youngest of right. seven siblings and it was just him. Wow. And I feel so very lucky that I grew up with this symbol that I was able yeah. to survive and thrive and that anything was possible because my dad had already accomplished and achieved that. But 80% yes. of little people, which is most little people, are born to two average high parents. So most of my friends wow. who look like me are the only one like them in their family. And it's that realization that sometimes disability or difference exists in lots mm. of different ways in a household. Sometimes you can feel like the only one. And I think I am such a so grateful to my dad for being that symbol of kind of representation and visibility growing up but i think he had challenges he had challenges with education and with school he had challenges not being able to reach things he had challenges in the same with me of people saying cruel and hurtful things and i think we have moved on a little bit it's easier to be a little mm -hmm. person now in some ways in other ways it's harder but i feel very lucky that i can learn from the lessons that he experienced and but there were other things that were such a challenge. So I think some of the reason why I'm really interested in fashion is because my dad is a little person, because I remember going to my teenage years and saying, dad, where do I get a pair of high heels and a skirt to fit this kind of body? And my dad was like, I, don't know. I wear a t-shirt. And I was like, right, I'll need to do some more research on that, dad, thanks. Pity he wasn't a cobbler. Um, <laughs> if oh. only, but that probably makes out why I'm wearing this green and gold dress today. I took it too far. God, he must be so he must be so proud of you and so proud of all that you're achieving. Um I hope so. But I think my parents are incredible people in that. Just as a human my being five as siblings. well. Yeah. You know, not not even of course oh. as a as a little person, but as a human being, as a woman, as a self-realized woman in a world that again pushes against individuality so often. And and I do think that all of us as a race have um unique characteristics that that both separate us from the from the group, but also allow us a chance to celebrate and, and, and not exclude and not see the differences in others. It, it's almost ironically in celebrating the differences, we see samenesses. Um, he must be so proud of you. <laughs> I hope so. He is listening to this from the other room and his big oh, thing is, would you tell hi, Colin dad. I said hello? So I said hi. Hey dad, how's it going? What's your dad's name? <laughs> His name is Chris. He'll be so chuffed with this moment in the spotlight. What's the story, Chris? And so, and so, listen. <laughs> so, school was school was school was a. Str I mean, school for me was a struggle. Um, God, you said you loved school. I did. I struggled in school. I struggled to, to to fit in, but I spent a lot of time. I think, um, and 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 wasted a lot of energy, like like a lot of our children and a lot of children in the world do, trying to fit in and 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 trying not to be different from the crowd. And yet, I think. Like I tell my youngest son, who's 11, I have two children. I have James, who's 17, and Henry, who's 11. And I kind of found myself telling Henry a few months ago, if you are in the cool group in school, you're probably not being 100% honest with yourself. You're probably making some concessions. You're probably compromising your inner voice just to, just to fit in a little bit. Did you feel, was there a time in school where you felt like you fit in more than other times? Or was there a time in school where you felt 
um, excluded more than other times? Was there a time in school that being a little person was brought to your attention in a way that, that wasn't pleasant, that made you feel like an outsider when you just wanted to be part of the collective? I remember my first day of school. I started school a little bit later than everybody else. I actually started school on the day of my fourth birthday because the principal at the time was a bit worried that my disability might affect my learning and my educational attainment and my ability to do the homework in school. So they said, why don't you start on the day of your fourth birthday? And if you need more time, you'll have an opportunity to repeat. So I started 19 days later than everybody else. And I remember, and I was always quite a precocious child in some ways. I remember kind of standing at the top of that classroom and the teacher saying, this is Sinead. She is new to our classroom. Why don't you say hello? And she turned to me, expecting me to kind of just wave. And I said, hi, my name is Sinead. I'm four years old. I have a A-C-H-O-N-D-R-O-P-L-A-S-I-A. And I'm a little person. And I think I'm really lucky that my parents gave me the language that I needed to have those conversations because so often I find that when we don't have the words, when we have a fear of saying or doing the wrong thing, often our response is to be apathetic and to do nothing. And that can happen if you're an adult, that can happen if you're Mm. a parent, or that can happen if you're a child. And it's just easier to do what it is that you know. It's easier to speak to the children who look like you. And I was really lucky that I was armed with that language to kind of at least present myself, put myself in a position of almost being an extrovert yeah. and explain who I was in the hope of easing that discomfort for others. But yeah, there were challenging moments in the yard and in the playground all the time where, particularly as I got older through the school system, even in primary school, as I got to be like 10 and 11, four-year-olds would come up to me and say, why are you so small? Like, you're the same size as me. Why are you in the older class? Wow. You should be with me. Yeah. And I admired their confidence. And there was no real maliciousness. I think it was just curiosity. And I looked so different to them. And I would just say things like, well, yes, I'm the same size as you, but I am older than you. I am 11 or I am 12 or whatever it might be. And I'm a little person. And I think, again, facilitating those conversations in some ways was probably a responsibility and a bit of a challenge and a bit of a burden. But it, I at least felt empowered because I had the words to describe I was going to say, but I also think I'm it really must have been lucky. very empowering. Like, it must have been very empowering yeah, but I think a, I'm really a slash nerve wracking at times yeah. to be able to stand solid and to stake your claim for your own individuality and make no apologies and, and display no shame because there was no shame within you because of obviously you were raised. No, I mean, the most gorgeous me. quote, I if I am a, yeah, if I am a success, it is because I am loved as a child. I mean, that's such a, such a beautiful quote. And I know as a parent, sometimes, you know, I, I, well, what am I like as a parent? I don't know. It's not for me to say, talk to the lads. They'll give you a different story. But it, it, but I, I, love to me is the most important thing. Love and understanding and compassion and patience. And I know that some parents, um, my, my dad was a little bit from a different era and he was a little bit, I don't know if it was an iron fist, but it, it, it certainly was, you know, a little bit hard at times. But I think he was trying to prepare me for the harshness of the world. And my philosophy is, look, the world is going to be hard anyway. I don't think I prepare my children for being hard to them. I prepare them for insulating them in a sense of whatever they do, as long as they're being honest with themselves, and as long as they're on a journey of curiosity or discovery, whatever they do is okay. And as long as they're on a journey of accepting themselves, it doesn't really matter. Of course, we all want to be accepted by the world, but it matters less. Our, our happiness isn't totally contingent on the world telling us we're okay. We know we're okay from the inside. You know, and you can't control how other people perceive you. And I think I'm really lucky that my difference or my disability, what makes me unique in some ways to other people is so obvious that you meet me for the first time in person. And there may be some initial nervousness or trepidation about what to say, how to say, do you stay standing? Do you sit down? How do you talk to me? But <laughs> the usual stuff. 30 seconds into that conversation. Yeah. You have figured out what accommodations I require. You can predict what it is that I need if I'm going to come to your house for a cup of tea. Well, Sinead's not going to be able to reach the biscuits there in the top press. I'm going to have to bring them down. But I look at you or maybe I look at your boys or I look at anybody I went to school with and they present themselves as a definition of normality that the world subscribes to. It may not be true, but what makes them different is not immediately obvious. And how long are we friends before you have to tell me whatever it is that you're struggling with? The identity that you are code switching and changing in between 
the ways in which you are different to everybody else. And it's that realization that we are all different. For some people, it's just visible and there are challenges that come with that. But if your disability or if what makes you different is less visible, there are challenges with that too. And exactly as you said, we need to build a culture. We need to encourage children to accept themselves, first of all, that they are enough as they are. They don't need to change who they are in order to feel valid to somebody else's opinions, but that we yeah. are enough just as we are. And we need that as children. We need that reminder as adults. We need that reminder as parents, because sometimes we can think our parenting is poor and not good enough. And I think we just totally. need that voice in our heads to tell us that we're doing OK. Totally. How, how do we, I agree fully, geez, do I ever, how do we go about doing that in the school system, in a school system that, you know, and, and some parents will be listening now and maybe some children will be listening as well. And schools seem so oriented towards, I mean, I mean, it's a result oriented environment, you know, it's so oriented. I think it's changing slowly, various schools at different paces, of course. Um, but it's about grades and it's about studying and it's about how do we go about having a more inclusive and a more total experience in school whereby the child's individuality, mental health, emotional well-being are all catered to and not molly coddled is where we come from, but really having an open dialogue and celebrating the difference of every child and celebrating moods and shifting moods and also acknowledging where struggles at home may present themselves in the in the classroom and how to have a patience and a compassion for those kind of realities that a lot of children deal with daily? I think it's about making the classroom a safe space, which is far yeah. easier said than done. I remember yeah. when I started teaching, people used to have all of these questions of, <clears throat> how are you going to control the children? They're going to be bigger than you. And my only response to that was, what a oh. terrible way to talk about children. Why do we need to control them? Why can't we respect them <laughs> if we wish them yeah. to respect us? So I used to just design my classroom into a U-shape. And I would stand at the top of the room and be at eye level with everybody. And it presented this culture of equity and equality and fairness right from nice. the immediacy. And yes, there were things I couldn't do. I couldn't hang up the artwork on the walls. So I would just set up a group of curators in my classroom who were four boys in the nice. inner city. And they'd say, oh, this boy tried an art this week. You were terrible. I'm going to do it. And, you know, I'm going to hang up mine instead. But also what I learned is that so often when we think about a curriculum, a curriculum is designed for a specific group of people who are often the majority or were the majority, which means that lots of children, when they open their books, don't feel seen and heard. I remember when I was teaching boys who were 11 or 12, we had pictures in our workbooks of cottages with thatched roofs, of bungalows, of all different types of houses, but not flats, nice. not apartments, no mention of the fact that you might be homeless or you might be in temporary accommodation. Yeah. And how do we evolve this? How do we create a culture of belonging? and a culture of safety? And then how do we root it in the child's own environment and experience? So I'll give you a classic example. I was teaching maths. My boys hated maths. They didn't see the relevance of it. They were like, why do we need to yeah. spend time learning long division? So I taught maths through the local takeout menu and told them the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> and they would say, so Snow White and Prince Charming are gone on a last minute date and we had to buy the food for the Seven Dwarfs. She's left 60 euro. But you know what seven men are like? They're fussy. We have a paleo, we have a vegan, we have a pescatarian, and they can't have the same food or there'll be confusion. So we need to have these different orders. Deliberately complicating it for those who were more academically able so that they could do it independently. And I sat with the boys who really struggled. And I said, okay, let's just work out the fries, the chips. And one of the lads who often demonstrated some of the most difficult behavior said, great, two bags, one bag is 250. So that means two bags of fiber. I was like, yes, that's multiplication, that's maths. He was like, no, Miss Work, it's not maths, it's dinner. And we can look at that and go, gosh, isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. And he yeah. was being really Beautiful. serious because he didn't see any relevance for his skills that he had at home in the classroom because, again, he wasn't represented. So how do we create space to realize that, yes, we are teaching 30 children in the classroom, or yes, we are teaching a curriculum of several thousand people who are going to do their state exams this year, but these are individuals. How do you ensure that when a child comes into your classroom, having had a very terrible morning for reasons you may never know, that your first reaction isn't to shout at them, isn't yeah. to punish them further, but you just say, listen, why don't you go for a walk? Why don't you come back in five minutes? Is there anything that I can do that will help you right now? I'll probably say no. And just give them space to figure out. I think so often we talk about children and big topics in a way in which we think they are too young to talk about. Even the pandemic, yeah. 
But children are, are living in this world where they understand so many of the challenges and the systemic injustices that exist. We as adults are just sometimes afraid that we don't have the language to have those conversations. But children are, are living in this reality right now. And it's important that we ensure that they feel seen, heard, respected, and just part of this enormous community that we're all in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think children have an enormous capability to adapt. Um, I had a friend this week saying to me, you know, saying to me, another father, his kids are grown up now, the youngest is 20, and then they go up, his three kids, 20, 23, and 26. But he was saying, you know, do you think that younger kids, kids who are four, five, six, seven, that they will be scarred forever because of what's happening now, because they're being homeschooled, because of mask wearing, because of the fear of this coronavirus, et cetera? And I said, I, I really don't think so. I mean, they may, but I think kids who are four, five, six, seven seem to, just be able to adapt to realities that are presented to them. And the good part of that is that it puts the pressure on us as adults to present a reality that is acknowledging of the world the way it is, but also not tense and not fearful of the world mm. and just accepting that there are struggles that we all go through, but there are also abilities to survive struggle. And kids are, yeah, I, I, I said to my think maybe for those, I think I was thinking myself, if I was 13 or 14 or 15 or 16 and I was missing those years and I was missing graduation, I might be frustrated. But I look at other kids that I know that are five, six, seven, and they, they're just with it. They have their masks on when they go out. They know about social distancing. They're not giving out about freedom and all this kind of stuff. They're not hard set into a reality that they have kind of said, this is the way life should be. Mm -hmm. Kids are still open to possibility. And that's both speaks to an enormous potential that kids have to live joyful and connected and expansive lives but also there is a sensitivity there that is on us as adults to acknowledge and to foster and to take care of um so the book that you wrote break the mold can you talk about the first time you thought about writing a book to express your thoughts and opinions based on your life experience and what you've observed in the world around you. It's interesting there you talk about hope and light and dark moments because I think that was fundamental to the making real of this book. And I think exactly as you said, as adults, we experience that undulating curve of light and darkness, but children do too. And it's important that we acknowledge it, even if we don't yeah. see that yeah. light and dark as the same meaning as ours it's still real and it's still important that we find ways to discuss it but in terms of writing the book i think i've always wanted to write a book i think everybody says that they have a book in them but for me as a teacher and as a disabled woman i really wanted to bring together my experiences and almost a, a kind of a manifesto of sorts because i was so lucky to grow up at a home where i was a loved child I was so lucky to grow up in a school community that fostered my curiosity, that encouraged me to dream that I could do anything. But then when I was a teacher, I realized that not all of those experiences are universal for every child. Not every child is born into a situation where they get to experience yeah. or hear that anything is possible for them. So what could I share? The book has come about quite quickly. At the beginning of the pandemic, I came home to Ireland. I used to travel quite a bit and all of a sudden realized that I had no work, I had no projects, I had nothing ahead of me and in some ways needed something to focus on. I began writing the book to see if there was anything in my experiences that could be a case study that would have universal themes. I wrote the book not far from this room, this space, at 4am every morning whilst my house was quiet and everybody was still asleep. In some ways it was kind of a beacon for my light and dark moments in the pandemic because I didn't know what would come next. I didn't know if I would still be able to work or advocate using technology, if change would still be possible when we're all so busy trying to fix the economy or the world or try to create a vaccine. And in some ways, I'm so grateful for that time at like just chipping away at this story. And what has been so powerful is the way in which Break the Mold has resonated with people. I've always believed that we are all different. And I think we have somehow moved to this understanding that we shouldn't see difference or that children don't see difference. And I think that's untrue. I think children just respond to difference 
with a humanity and with a curiosity that we should embrace. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge difference. And as you said earlier, within that difference, there is a shared humanity and a shared understanding of, of what it means to be on this planet and in this community right now. And I didn't know if my lived experience as a little person would shape how a deaf person or an autistic person or somebody who is trans or somebody who is exploring their gender identity and whether or not they are gay or straight, whether it would resonate with them. And Gosh, I am so grateful. The past few weeks have been the most glorious of parents, teachers, children, young adults beautiful. getting in touch and saying, oh, I see myself in your book. Oh, I see beautiful. myself in your book. I see myself in part of the illustrations, in the stories, and or I want to do better for my friends. There's a section in the book that gives children some mm. of the language for situations that they might come about in. That what about if you're in the yard? And if one of your group of friends, going back to what you were saying about whether one of your boys is in the cool group, one of your friends in your group of friends points to somebody else in the yard and says, he's gay. What do you do? Because if you say nothing, it could be considered that you agree with them. Complicity, do you feel yeah. empowered or like you have the words or language to say something? It could be as simple as say, maybe he is gay. It's okay to be gay, but it's not okay yeah. to be cruel and unkind. And sometimes that's that's as simple as it is. It's as simple as standing up for somebody else in a way that doesn't make you feel unsafe, doesn't make them feel unsafe, but just redefines to people that it's not cool to make people feel less. We all need to feel like we belong. It's, it's, oh my God, it's the most uncool thing in the world. And it's one of the easiest things I think that we can commit to, sadly, and therein lies the trap. One of the easiest things we can commit to as human beings, whether it's, whether it's adults, whether it's children, whether it's average height people, little people, all of us is, is group cruelty. You know, it's unfortunately, unfortunately exclusion, bullying isn't so much about the person, isn't so much about excluding someone from the group. Bullying forms, offers an opportunity for people to come together. That sounds like I'm mm. pro bullying. I'm so not. It's 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 a fear of aloneness and a fear of being excluded that mm. has a child or a grown up be silent when they see someone being treated cruelly. So I think a fear of aloneness is one of the great themes that certainly in my life, I know my aloneness, my fundamental as a human being, I came into the world. I don't know if I had a name when I arrived, but I was Colin shortly thereafter. And I've been alone since I was born. I have family. I'm lucky enough to have family and some friends. And I'm lucky enough to be blessed with two children now. But I still at 44 and haven't had a, f a career in film and all this kind of stuff. I still struggle with my fundamental aloneness, with the fact that I am one human being. And I still wonder at times where I fit in, not where do I want to fit in, not where do I wish I fit in, but where do I actually fit in? Who are my tribe? And I could say my tribe are seven plus billion people. But as we all know, you meet some people and they're not particularly your tribe and you meet other people and you gravitate more towards them. But it's that aloneness that I think almost we have to accept. Aloneness, another way of saying individuality, our uniqueness yeah. that we have to accept and hold. And if we accept and hold that, well, then we can reach out to the greater community. Well, then we can yeah. become part of a tribe and we need each other to lean into yeah. you know yeah well it's funny that you mentioned that you know when when i visit schools now i often get asked a question by younger children like if you had a magic wand would you change who you are and children are always surprised when i say no that i'm really happy and comfortable and proud to be me but in many ways oh. i had an option when i was 11 years old i was offered limb lengthening surgery which is the delivery <clears throat> fracturing of my leg bones and over the course of 12 months they are stretched apart so that new bone grows oh, and you gain probably an extra three to six inches in height it's not too common but it does exist and i had to contemplate that at 11 because it was just before the growth spurt so it would give you the maximum amount of height and i remember talking to my dad about it my dad had never had it done he said this needs to be your decision my mom said the same she said you need to make this decision for wow. you you can't live to regret this because we made this decision for you and i remember thinking about it you know, the opportunities were that I'd be able to reach light switches or maybe I'd be able to reach a higher shelf in a fridge or maybe I'd be able to do something else without having to ask for help. But Let's actually, change the, fundamental the light reason switches. why I was Let's even change. considering it. Yeah. <laughs> but the fundamental reason why I was fridge. considering it was because 
in school, I was thinking, gosh, maybe it'll make people like me easier. Maybe people yeah, will sure. have less nervousness about starting a conversation with me. Maybe it'll be easier to fit in because I will look closer to how everybody else looks. And I thought about it. I thought about it for a long time, 11. And I remember going into my parents and saying to them, I've made a decision. And they said, OK. And I said, I have decided that if people don't like me because I'm a little person, that's not mm. my fault. That's not my responsibility. And that's not the people. And, that's and not I the can't people change who I am. With. No, exactly. There are better friends out there. And sometimes I might have one friend. Yeah, of course. Sometimes I might have 10 friends. Sometimes I have, might have no friends. The number of friends that I have doesn't quantify my worth as a person. And I need to be happy with myself and comfortable with myself. And exactly as you said, we should be encouraging children to realize that we can change the world. We can change the light switches. We can change the fridge. We can make all of yeah, those things different because totally. they have been designed by people. We shouldn't be asking people to change who they yeah. are in oh order to God. have friends or fit in. Without, without, without existentially judging such a invasive and violent operation, it just sounds so horrendously painful and... God, I don't want to say a betrayal of one's natural self because I have to respect each person's decision. Absolutely, like deeply respect it. But that's God, uh, it's, it's, it's so aggressive. And I'm very glad for you individually that you were in a place where you had garnered enough self-love and self-regard and self-acceptance that you were like, you, you, did you think of it seriously for a while? And then and then go, you know, I what? Did. I mean, had it's, a a, list. it's a big thing. Yeah. Go on. Pros and cons. I had a list of, of pros and cons. Yeah. And things that I that life would be easier if I undertook it and it would also be more challenging. <laughs> but I think it was it came at a really good time for me personally because I had considered those things at 11. It made my teenage years much easier, I think, because whilst the rest of the girls in my class were grappling with trying to get the attention of boys or trying to look like the models on a magazine, I had already, A, accepted who I was and grown comfortable in my own skin. But also the notion of looking at models on the cover of a magazine and wanting to be those people wasn't something that I could naturally access. There was never any visibility for people like me. And in some ways, that's probably where my interest in fashion came about. And then you end up on the cover of Vogue. This is so brilliant. It's Ridiculous. so brilliant. One of the great ironies of life. You know, you go, well, I'm not going to be going to that. And I'm obviously not going to be ending up modeling. I'm like, cut to cover of Vogue. So it's just like this strange karmic tip of the hat to your ability to stay honest with yourself and live your own life. Yeah. I mean, the idea of fitting in, you know, you'd say fitting, fitting in, the, the uh, fitting in can only exist if there is an out. So if you, you know, the Chasing. idea of fitting in has to be, there has to be an out. So the, the idea of your book is, is to, is to psychologically is to, to realize that there is no place in the world for outside. We all are, whether we like yeah. it or not, and whether we have arguments with it or not, we are all sharing this experience on this globe. I mean, that's one, I don't want to say good thing about the pandemic, but maybe, you know, in the most dire of situations, we try and look for, not to delude ourselves, but because there is always some some honey to be garnered from, from struggle, we try to look for the positives. And one of the positive things, it, and you know, economic situations of course have informed how certain communities have been hit by the virus and the treatments that certain people yeah. can avail of depending on where they are on the economic scale but we have as a globe been brought together by this and there's great separation as well there's a there's a there's a lot happening yeah, but it gives us but opportunity no Colin, like we know yeah, go on yeah no it gives us opportunity like i think exactly as you said if there are insiders there are outsiders but what we're trying to do is create this understanding that there is space for all of us but also the All idea that the space you want to take up right now might change in five years. You might be a different person depending okay. on what it is you believe in or think of yourself then. And that's okay too. We are changing human beings. But I think you're totally. exactly right. You know, this moment is making us think about everything. Even from a disability perspective, we're talking about things like social distancing, which actually could be another word for accessibility. Because if we're going to create wider mm -hmm. spaces for people to be able to yeah, socially yeah. distance, well, then we can create wider spaces for wheelchair users. If we're going to think about yeah. not being able to touch things because we need to wash our hands afterwards, well, then we can think about people who are blind or deaf or autistic. And we now have an opportunity where we can redesign the future. We can yeah. take all of the things at foundational level and say, you know what, we're going to start from the beginning. We have a real chance now to include Sorry. everybody. And actually the children and the parents who are watching this are the people who may be going to college, maybe going to school, who can like imagine what place they want to take up in the future. Maybe that's an architect or an astronaut or a teacher or an actor, whatever it might be. We have the opportunity to make a real difference. 
And we can start that by figuring out who we are, what we want to be and grow mm -hmm. comfortable in our own skin. And I, I love the idea you talk about change being the one constant, because the only constant in my life is that I'm human. It's the only constant. It's not that I'm happy, that I'm sad, that I'm feeling, that I'm numb, that I'm annoyed, that I'm angry, that I'm peaceful, that I'm kind, that I'm mean. I'm all of those things at various days, various yeah. weeks, various hours or minutes within the day. But the one constant is that I'm human. It's the same constant you have. It's the same constant your dad has, the same constant your mom has and your siblings have and every my two children have. So that should be the only thing that, that we deem as unchangeable, whether we're talking about LGBT rights, whether we're talking about rights for those with disabilities, the one constant that we all share, regardless of disability or ability. And I want to ask you about disability as well. But the one constant yeah. is that we're human, all of us. And it's, and it's a lot to be human. It's a lot to be a child and wonder where you fit in. It's a lot to be a child and wonder, do you belong? And wonder, do you have worth? And wonder, are you smart enough? Are you fast enough? Are you good enough at this? Yeah. Are you good looking enough? All that kind of stuff. And none of it, when the final song is played, none of it really matters, this idea of enough. By virtue of having breath in one's body, by virtue of being feeling yeah. and thinking, you are enough. But accessing that, how does exactly. a child, and, and, and most of us as adults still struggle, how does a child access that? Yeah. yeah. I think it's about figuring out a new definition of worth. That it's, yeah. you know, it's yeah. not just about whether or not you are sporty enough or pretty enough yeah. or handsome enough, whatever those things are. But I guess going back to this notion of kind of kindness and curiosity, what do you do every day to light up somebody else's moment or room? Mm. What impact can you have on other people? And sometimes that is a smile. Sometimes that is helping somebody across the road. Somebody at times that's mowing your neighbor's lawn who is a little bit too old and can't, not a little bit too old, a little bit older and can't mow their own lawn and needs some help in this time. There's things that we can do every day. Sometimes that's a conversation or stopping to ask somebody if they need help. And I think that needs to be the metric that we measure ourselves off. Like, what's our purpose? What do we stand for? What do we believe in? How do we connect with others? How do we help others? Rather than focusing it so much on ourselves and our work based on old metrics, what can we do mm -hmm. to make a difference? So I was going to say, by that logic, it sounds to me that you're saying the greatest responsibility, and and I, I like this idea, the, and it's yours, I'm not, the greatest responsibility ours the greatest responsibility an individual has a child or an adult has to themselves is to acknowledge not to put the weight of the world on your shoulders and not everyone's mood of course are we responsible for but to acknowledge that you have a responsibility to the world around you that every single person you meet is going through something and that you have you must know that every interaction you have will affect the person you're interacting with whatever way you do and it can happen it can happen in a second i don't know about you yeah. but there are days when you know my dad will say something in a specific tone and i'll want to mirror his tone and i know that all that mm. will happen is one voice will get louder and one voice it doesn't escalate escalate and all that happens yeah. is that everybody just gets exhausted and tired by it but i think acknowledging that everybody is going through a difficult time I think, and asking people to do that for you, to give you space to kind of make mistakes and to learn. But I think we're all connected, yeah. that the decisions and the choices that we make impact people and the planet. We can't choose who we are. We cannot choose how we are born, what family we are born into, what religion, what disability, what gender, what sexual orientation, what race we are. We don't choose any of those. We so Most of us don't even yeah. choose our name. But what we do get to choose is how our actions impact others. We do get to choose yeah. how we behave towards others, how we pick up litter to save the planet, whatever it might be. And it's realizing that we should be less focused on measuring the things that we have no choice over, which may be our looks, which may be our athletic ability. But we should focus yeah. on the impact that we can have because we actually have full control and agency over that. We can make a difference today and every day based on those things. Yeah, that's lovely. So disability, so what's what that word, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because it's so... It's so loaded yeah. and it's both specific and vague. And the last thing you feel to me, of course, is disabled in any way. It was like the email we yeah. sent last night. And, you know, I'm looking at you at the TED Talk and I listen to you on the Graham Norton show. And I'm, I just got your book. So I've started that. And, you know, you're a little person. You're human. You're a little person. But the, and I emailed you the, the 
the last thing you are is little or something like that. And then I emailed that and I thought, God, is that insulting? But it's, you don't, you're not disabled to me. I don't, I don't, I'm not talking to a disabled person, but your disability, I assume, I imagine, and tell me if I'm talking, uh, if I'm wrong, is more to do with the world you're presented with rather than a disability yeah, that you I inherently think it is a have. little bit. Well, I think it's a bit of both. And I think to explain yeah. this, we kind of need to go back to language. When I was growing up, yeah. I used to just say, I'm just Sinead, just call me Sinead. And that was fine until I couldn't get into a building or I couldn't go to yeah. a public bathroom and wash my hands. And when I looked at like the legislation and the rules as to why everything was built so high, it was designed for accessibility for some or not others. And I began to then describe myself as a person with a disability. And I would say, call me a person. Mm -hmm. And my disability is over there, kind of whispered it. Yeah. And I realized what I was right. doing is that I was attaching shame to my disability because I had been right. taught that disability was something to be shameful of, to mm -hmm. be embarrassed about. Because in thinking about disability, our understanding of disability is about a burden. Like right. if you go back not too long ago, disabled people when they were born, they were considered a burden on their families and on their communities. And the solution I, is to take the disabled people out, hide them away, I, move yeah. them away. They're not part of us. And what we did in that time was we built the whole world and designed it. And then we realized that actually we should include disabled people and we brought them back into our homes and our communities. And then we realized there were no lifts, there were no ramps, there were no sign language interpreters, there was no sensory understanding. So we built a world whilst we hid them away. And I think now we have moved from that sense of real stigma and embarrassment to creating a sense of pride. So I'm really proud to be disabled because it's an identity and a broader community, not just little people, but disabled people generally, be it visible or invisible dis disabilities that I'm a part of, that we are shaped by the perspectives that we view in the world. Now there's some other language that's used to try to kind of distill that notion of disability because it is so weighted. Some people say special needs, but the disabled community would argue, my needs aren't special. I have a right to be able to access the world around me in the same way as everybody else. And by Funny, saying isn't special, it? So you're many... making it seem optional. You're making it seem optional. And this notion well, of being I, differently might... abled. I might, this might be the wrong thing to say, but I, 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 like my son, you know, could be understandably termed special needs or disabled or differently abled. Um, and I've said kind of, you know, in glib moments in my life, well, I'm special needs. I have special needs. Like I, or I'm disabled. I'm a shite in the water. I'm not a good swimmer. You put me into the water, I'm fucking disabled. You put my son James in the water and he's in his natural element. James is 17. He has a condition called Angelman syndrome. And there's many um, characteristics to what he has. And one of them is he doesn't have verbal language he, and he's not uh, self-sufficient. He, he, I mean, one should never say never, of course, but the chances are the probability, high probability is that James will never be able to take care of himself, you know, to, to, he can feed himself and he took his first steps just short of his fourth birthday. And he's the most magnificent boy in the world, but his, yeah, his life is one that I have such a, respect for James's struggles. I have a respect for everybody's struggles, whether the person is is disabled, special needs, more typical, more average. Um, but I just don't see him apart. That's the thing. He's just a little bit more obviously unique. That's all. Yeah. And You're I think unique. That's the, I'm that's... unique. The guy that's recording this conversation mm. is unique. James is just my uniqueness or my brother's uniqueness or my friend's uniqueness you don't really see from 20 feet away you 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 yeah. you, you 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 can if you want to get really into physical characteristics you can go okay you know your man has red hair that makes him more unique especially in los angeles not so much at home in dublin but but the thing is it's only in really talking to people the majority of the time that you learn what their uniqueness is that you learn what their tastes are what their ideologies are how they feel about things but for someone like James, you can see it from 20 feet away instantly. His uniqueness is and so, so for stark. Me, mm. Yeah, and the disability is so obvious. And for me, where I think the importance of language it's comes beautiful. in is that where disability is, is important as a framework is in thinking about access. So for example, the Americans with Disability right. Access Practical. is 30 years old this year. It's an incredible piece of legislation and law that was supposed to be about a, a starting point just about ensuring that disabled people could go to school, that disabled people, if they okay. could, could live independently and could get a job without being discriminated against. The Disability Equality Act in the UK is 20 years old this year. 
So what disability gives us as a language and as a framework is ensuring that we are not treated less by the law, by education or by employers as institutions because we are disabled. It gives us a protection in identifying as part of that community and the language. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas I, if I was just funny. Sinead, and if I didn't get a job because the desk was too high, I would have no framework for arguing that. Of course that not. Sense. But because I'm disabled, yeah, no, it's absolutely. discrimination. Yeah, absolutely. So that's where so the you're connection just comes about in. The, and I think that's where the pride comes in. You're just talking about the acknowledgements of honesty. Or the honesty of acknowledgements. And the acknowledgement, you know? Yeah, and that we need different adaptations all of us do exactly as you were saying you might not yeah. be a very good swimmer and that's not necessarily because you, <laughs> because of what it is it's a skill that you don't have and i think it's finding a space in the middle where we can acknowledge the abilities that everybody has the things that other people find challenging but also find a space where yes. there is a community and the pride of a disability where there is protection yeah. where we can be who we are without having to change to fit in. I think it's all connected. And I think language is important and powerful. But I also think it's really personal that what I prefer, you might not prefer. Yeah, and of I course. think it's about Absolutely. figuring out what words you're comfortable with and then identifying with those. So tell me, thank you for that. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing at the moment in your life to promote this change, both in language and in the physical world that we are presented with daily, that things are as accessible as they should be for every single member of the global community to, to avail of all the same services that we all get to experience. Tell us. Well, that is that. a great question and something that I've only just started. So I don't think there's too much change, but I have hope and ambition that it will get bigger bit and broader. Bit, bit, so one of the things bit, that I would bit, like yeah. to do Exactly. It's starting conversations like that with a book where schools and parents and teachers and around dining room tables and Christmas trees and Hanukkahs were having conversations in relation to disability and diversity and difference. But what I'm also trying to do is to ensure that places that disabled people go into are considered already as to what it is that they need. So, for example, if you're autistic and you're going to a coffee shop, I want to make sure that that coffee shop is designed with you in mind. So, for example, but there's no music or that there's no music on a specific day that you want to go, or that the lighting is low so that it doesn't affect mm. your sensitivities and make it feel disruptive. I also Gorgeous. want to make sure that if you are deaf, that the floors in the coffee shop are wooden so that when you walk in, you can feel and sense the vibrations and you know if there are mm. people around you so that you can feel safe, so that you can ensure Beautiful. that it's not just you and I think it's about thinking those things through. In the fashion industry, okay, I do some work. I believe that fashion is really important. <laughs> I believe that fashion is No, but no one's thinking of this. I mean, the vibration. Of... It's important. It's Please. important that we move this forward. And I think for me, you know, wearing this dress says something about myself. You can't see the full length, but it's pretty spectacular with a train <laughs> also, which is quite a lot. Come on, man, tilt the camera home. down. I dressed up for you, Colin. I dressed up for you. I could do, I could do like a Hollywood red carpet up and down. You won't do the <laughs> full look. So I'll save beautiful. that for another time. You look beautiful. But for me, mm. in thinking about fashion that, you know, so much of my physicality, so much of what I look like, people have assumptions about who I am or what I can do, whether that's from film or television. People often think I'm the butt of a joke or they think they act cruelly towards me. Whereas fashion gives me a power to present to the world who I am. That you'll say, oh, she's wearing a green and gold dress. There she is now. There she is now in a cape I mean, on a Tuesday seriously. in a cape. Oh, my God. God. Talk about powerful. Such mm. a beautiful image, agency. man. But how do I ensure that changes that happen for me aren't just unique to me? The work that I'm doing right totally. now is ensuring that, making sure that I don't just get to be the first, but I'm creating a yeah. blueprint where we create systemic change. So the work that You're I'm doing in fashion is in thinking about not just disabled people as customers, because when we think about disabled people as coming into the shop to maybe buy a bag or to buy a dress or to buy a pair of trousers, we think of everything as kind of conditional. We think, oh, well, we'll make the store accessible if they come in. Oh, well, we'll think about them in marketing campaigns if they are customers right. and buy products and we can see it. Whereas That'd instead, what I'm doing is creating employment projects where disabled people are going to be employed in stores. And that's giving us an opportunity to begin to assess, OK, what stores have lifts? What stores are have no step access in the front and at the back? How do we think about uniforms for disabled people? Well, you know, zips in the back are difficult for everybody. Why don't we put magnets in the front? Why don't we put Velcro? 
why don't we think about including disabled people in campaigns in a meaningful way? And I've just started. It's common sense. That's exactly. Common sense. So I'm looking time. at all the ideas you have. Common sense. Yeah, common sense approaches to to shared problems. That's that's all it is really. Consideration. And I think a lot of us just are ignorant. I mean, you 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 could put me in a room that was lit with beautiful music playing that was so conducive to the fluidity of human thought and imagination and say to me, what kind of floor would you have that would assist a deaf person who was arriving in an establishment to buy a cup of coffee? And I would never have come up with what you said. Now, as soon as you started saying it, I got the vibratory nature of what you were saying, but I would never think of that. I mean, it just, you're blazing a trail. It's really important that you're around and it's really important that you have the voice that you have and you fought to be heard in the way that you have. And I want to ask you, your book, Break the Mold. So I think one of the most, um, I think one of the most constricting things, one of the hardest things for human beings, children, and then adults also in life is to, to be honest with ourselves for sure and, 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 and allow ourselves whatever feelings we're having, sadness, anger, joy, happy, all of the emotions that we have all have a place. There's no such thing as a bad emotion. There are unhealthy expressions perhaps of emotion, but apart from that, apart from accepting ourselves, the fear that we have of being accepted by others means that shame is always just sitting on your shoulder, whispering into your ear, don't do it, don't do it, don't express your opinion, don't say how you feel. I wonder in creating this book, in, in either writing the book, was there moments in writing it where you felt vulnerability, where you felt afraid in relation to what you were writing and how it was going to be received are in the book being published eventually was there a moment when you were gripped by fear uh, by you know trepidation as to how you were going to be perceived because that's something that i think children and their parents watching now will identify with it's just the fear of speaking up you know the fear of putting your hand up in class and saying something you know i love the thing that there's no such thing as a, as a stupid question of course there's not there's just people that are willing to yeah. judge your question far too easily but could you talk a little bit about your process the personal process of creating this this book i wrote the first draft of this book relatively quickly and you did it's fair to say that i was very confident in how brilliant it was or at least how brilliant it was <laughs> it was 10 chapters of me very little of everyone else and i thought they're gonna love this they are just going to think that this is exceptional and i sent it with huge confidence and the feedback that came back was no this is <laughs> not accessible to children it is too much about yourself this is not a biography this is not the book that we thought we would get to release to the world you need to start again and that was probably wow. one of the hardest things that i've ever done because i was writing it on my own in the dark in the mornings when everybody was asleep it felt like such a personal exercise where i was like extracting parts of my soul and giving them to the world putting them in a book where people may have no context as to who I am, how I came to be in this world and this position and what I was trying to do. And I felt, I felt so vulnerable. I felt so afraid that I was putting parts of myself on the record that might exist yeah. forever, or it might exist for a week and never be spoken about ever again. And both of those things, the idea that it might be a success or it might be a failure, was something I know, that I yeah. found really difficult because a lot of my work had been in speaking, in rhetoric and things that weren't tangible and things that weren't measurable. They were trying to change hearts and minds. This was a physical product and we finished it. And what was so great was my publishers were really open to being challenged and open to challenging me and thinking about, there was a conversation in the middle of the book where there's an exercise at the back where we talk about a child spending some time with his friends at the weekend. And at the last minute, they have decided, pre-pandemic, to go to the cinema, to go to the restaurant, and to go bowling. And at the last minute, one of their friends backs out and says, really sorry, I'm not going to be able to go. Their excuse doesn't really make sense. And it asks the child, do you question if it's because of money? Why don't you suggest instead, come to my house? We'll rent a movie and we'll order a pizza and it'll be great and we'll get to spend time together. And all of a sudden, everybody can go. And I remember talking to my publishers about it and them asking the question, do children that young understand poverty? And maybe if you have no tangible connection 
to those who have more than you or those who have less than you. Maybe you won't know. But if you are a child who is constantly aware that your friends have more money than you, your friends don't have to worry about the next meal or where it's coming from. If that's your lived experience, you will be so tangibly aware of it. And the book was for that child, for that child to feel seen and heard and for that child's friends to know that they should do better to ensure that including people is a really meaningful exercise. But I was really nervous. I mean, there was a period where I was writing and editing the book every single day for four or five months. Then all of a sudden the book oh went God. off to the printers. I didn't see it. I couldn't touch it ever again. And then I received Terrifying, a physical yeah. copy in my hand a week before it came out and was published. And it was just haunting. I remember looking through it going, I don't know if I actually want to read this because there's nothing more I can do if it's terrible, if there's mistakes, if I've said the wrong thing, if I've made somebody upset, it's now going out into the world. And I almost, I think if I could have rang the publishers and said, I'm really sorry, can you actually take it off the shelves? That'd be great. I'd feel so much better about myself. <laughs> but then I was going to my local bookshops here in Navin and, and seeing it, you know, being announced that it was going to be out, it was going to be on the shelves, going to libraries, seeing it there, even during the time when shops That's and libraries huge. were closed. It was just so powerful. And I'm so proud of it. And we did so many things to ensure that it was truly accessible. It's available in Braille. Um, we ensured that it oh, was available by audiobook for those who want to listen to it rather than read it. And people have just really got on board in thinking about who this book could be for and what impact it could have in classrooms and at homes. And I'm so grateful. I think if I look back at this time last year, I always wanted to write a book, but I had no idea that if writing a book would be in my immediate horizon. And now to see it being given the Irish Book Award of the Year for Children's Books Senior is just so ridiculous and exceptional. And I think proves, particularly in a time where it has felt so divisive for such a long time, the idea of being an individual, the idea of talking about your identity has been so debated. Where a book that reminds us of the importance of what makes us different, the importance of race and disability as something that instills pride rather than stigma or embarrassment. The idea that that book is a success not in sales and monetary, but a success with children and with families and with classrooms is all the prize I need. Okay, you're just have to sell it to me. I'll read it. No, I can't wait. I was going to say to the audience, I said already, I just received my copy. So I, I basically just before the chat got to dip in, I can't wait. So the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. We really are only limited by our belief at times in what other people say about us, you know, if they say negative things or if they tell us that, you know, we're only capable of this, that or the other, you know, we, we really have such opportunity in our lives to experience such a diverse range of travels and relationships and communications and achievements and glorious failures. It's not all about success even. What's the idea? I mean, you just... No talked about success and you said not in monetary or sales but in the fact that parents and children have read the book and responded to it and the book has meant something to them that's a success somebody asked me a while ago like the idea of success I did a film once and uh, um, this film wasn't seen by many people and it got okay reviews but really kind of lost a load of money but it was a film that my mother as a result of an introduction that was made by the producers of the film Years later, four or five years after I did the film, the producers of the film introduced my mother to a friend of theirs. And my mother now lives with that friend of theirs, having been married six years ago in my back garden. Totally. And they live here in Los Angeles, the two of them in their apartment, and they're very in love. My father is also remarried, I should say, and he's very in love. And the two of them are really happy and it's wonderful. But that film, from one vantage point, wasn't a success. From one vantage point, mm -hmm. an economic vantage point the film was what in hollywood terms would be called an economic or commercial failure it is the most successful film i've ever done why because my mother now lives in a loving marriage three miles away from my home with a man who's kind and loving to her so the idea of success needs to also and that goes back to what we we're talking initially yeah. about school and the grade orient and you never know where a moment of, will lead to and don't put so much pressure on yourself in that moment to think about what it's going to be for you. And I think it's a day at a time. And as you were saying, be yeah. honest to who you are. Try to make a difference to others. And there is no full stop. There's full stops in the no. written word, but not in the, lived, not in the lived experience. Not in the lived experience.
you know, I think. Um, tell me about changing language, just for a second. I mean, talk about making rules and, and forming language and stuff. So you got uh, a term, you got some language in yeah. Gaelic in the Irish language. But exactly as you were saying, in terms of thinking about changing the world. Yeah, in terms yeah. of thinking about the changes that we can make, in terms of thinking that anything is possible. Well, I had an example of that once. Mm. When I was doing my Leaving Cert or Irish oral exam, which you're about 17, it's a, an exam that you have to do where you have to practice the language you speak and show them how good you are. I had to describe myself as a dwarf, which isn't a word that I would naturally gravitate to in English. I would often say yeah. that I'm a little person, but I had to use that word because there was no other. And then when I got a little bit older, I just emailed Fergus Nagrelia, which is the department responsible for the Irish language. And I said, hi, my name is Sinead. <laughs> and my question, how do I get a word put in the Irish language? And they said, well, what's your suggestion? And I said, well, bin a biog. I said, it's the direct translation. And they said, yeah, sure. OK, we can include it. And it's now in there. And often we think things are impossible because we haven't thought to ask or because we just continue to do the same things as we've always been doing without any reflection as to why we did them or who it's impacting or how it could be better. And I think if there's any lesson that you and I could teach the boys and girls and children and the parents who are watching this, it's like, did you know that this is what you would be doing when you were a child, Colin? This? Absolutely not. Yeah, no, no, not no, no, no. I still don't know. Like, if, I still don't know. No, 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 no. This conversation I knew was coming a long way down the, the tracks. No, no, no. I still reserve the right to go. I'm not sure that this is what I want to do acting when I grow up. I'm not sure what I want to do yet when I grow up. I may have a change of heart. I really, I'm not even joking about that. I get great meaning from, you know, my job at times and I have great fun. I meet great people and I've got to see parts of the world I probably wouldn't have seen. But I reserve the right to go. I'm still not 100% sure. I don't, as I said, I get great meaning from my work at times, but I don't, I try not to attach too much meaning to my work, mm. you know, especially because I do something that the, the ability to do it can be taken from me in a second. It's not like I necessarily go out and make my own stuff, you know, I'm not shooting my own film. So, yeah. no, this is not what I saw I'd be doing. And I don't know if I'll be doing it in five years. As I said, no definitive punctuation in, in anything that we do. The, the only thing when you were talking about doing the leaving cert and filling out, you know, various things that, that one might uh, pursue in a third level education, the only thing that I ever wanted to do, only thing that had any kind of academia involved was journalism. That was the only thing that I ever thought of doing outside of acting. Well, but since I did my first I acting, hope that this is the start of yeah, yeah, here we go. This is the start of it. This is the start. Yeah, this is the end of this is both the start of that and the end of my acting career today. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, that was the only thing. That was the only thing, you know. And I just, I think it just goes, I think I just, you know, I just find human beings fascinating, people fascinating, and the human experience one of great beauty and, and, and great ugliness and, and great joy and great pain. And, and I just, yeah, the human experience is just infinitely fascinating to me and, and, and unanswerable. But it's, it's that thing, God, which you're just talking about the Irish language and I'm saying unanswerable. It's not even, you know, the definitive location of an answer for anything. It's just constantly questioning. And so you have to refer to yourself as a dwarf in, in, a, in, a, in a test because there is no linguistic articulation of what you recognize yourself to be, which is a little person. So instead of going to a friend, and you may have done this as well, oh, Jesus, I have to call myself, oh, so embarrassing. It's such a pit. There's nothing in the Irish language to say little person. Instead of just doing that, you may have done that, but you didn't stop there if you did that. And you went further and you said, instead of just complaining about something, I'm going to have a little moment where I think of how do I affect change? Just that. Can I change it? Can I inform the way things are in a conscious way to make the world a little bit more expansive and a little bit more allowing and permitting and, and accepting? You know, it's awesome. It's cool. It's a really well, good lesson. I think that is an amazing note to leave our audience on because I am really excited that for these young people who are watching this, where are they going to be in 10, 15, 20 years? Maybe they're going to be a Hollywood actor. Maybe they're going to change a language and anything is and everything is possible. And I'm just so grateful, anything Colin, that you possible. said yes to doing this. My goodness. Thanks Thank a million you so for this much. chat. And no, I didn't finish. I didn't do great in school. I didn't do, I failed every single thing I could. The only exam I ever got 100% in was the are you an alcoholic exam I did 15 years ago. And <laughs> um, and so anything is possible. And and as long as there's breath in the body and, and, and you know, anything is possible. Great change, 180 degrees. It's, it's all possible for us at any given time no matter how the world pushes against one, you know.
thanks a million for taking the time and for letting me have a chat with you, Sinead. And come here, I wish you all the Such luck joy. to break Thank the you. mold, how to take your place and in you the and world. your journalism you career. I'm excited. Take your place in the world. I know. Yeah, more to come. I'll be in touch. <laughs> take care. Bye. Take care of yourself, and Bye. we'll talk soon. I'll email you or whatever. Bye, John. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.